we're in the midst of a huge transformation where it appears communities and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, she, her, and hers. I am the Senior Partnerships Manager here at All Voices. Today, I am super excited to welcome our next guest onto the interview series, Aliza Colombani. She's the Chief People Officer at Artsy. Um, Aliza, thank you so much for being here. If you want to share a little bit about yourself for our listeners, including your pronouns and when you were younger, do you remember how exactly you answered the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Christina. Um, yeah, so I'm Aliza Kalabani, go by she, her. Um, I, oh, that dreaded question of what you want to be when you grow up. I, like many kids, I think, really only knew about the jobs that I saw. So, you know, my first desire was to be a firefighter. Uh, I wanted to be an archaeologist at one point. I wanted to be a teacher the year I had a teacher I loved. Um, you know, no one really thinks about being a head of HR as a kid because you don't really know what HR is. And that's what I try to tell kids when I talk to them now. Like, you have no idea what all your options are because you're exposed to really such a small amount of jobs and functions as a kid. Um, I I think the thing that's probably most consistent kind of throughout my life and that's always brought me joy is just authentic personal connection and just really being able to connect and understand people deeply, uh, deep kind of good conversation and problem solving with people, being around super smart, inspiring people and getting to play a role and helping them be their best selves. Um, I didn't really know what that would mean as a job, but I think younger me would have identified with those kind of as much as I do now. I love that. I definitely agree. Kind of the foundation for that question of kind of what were you exposed to and kind of what uh, jobs or quote unquote careers uh, did you know were out there as well. I think a lot of people are looking for that authentic connection um, in those meaningful relationships in their lives. And sometimes, if not most of the time, you meet a lot of folks uh, at work as well. I would love to know how has your personal journey really led you to help folks really facilitate those relationships uh, in your current role as Chief People Officer at Artsy? Yeah, so I first entered the workforce in 2009, which uh, for those of you who remember was not a great time to be job searching. It was kind of the middle of the recession. And I think it actually in retrospect forced me to take more chances that I normally would have because there were just so few attractive sort of traditional jobs with benefits and pensions and all the things that I think maybe you know a few years previous would have just been more tempting to me. And I had always been really in love with food and cooking, had sort of discovered that about myself in college. I'm French originally, so it's very much in my roots. Um, and I found an internship cooking at the American Academy in Rome in their uh, their like sustainable food project and it didn't pay. It also didn't cost anything. And they housed and fed me in Rome. And, um, it was sort of in retrospect, a random first job to have, but I cooking was something I wanted to pursue. I was definitely not in the position to sign up for a very expensive culinary school. And I'm glad I didn't because I think, those five months really taught me to love food, but also to realize that my place wasn't in a professional kitchen. Um, that said, it really taught me how to be part of a team, how to work really, really hard, uh, the value of camaraderie, of training people really well, um, and of culture generally at work. Um, and I, I'm actually sort of shocked at how often I still think back to that experience as really formative, um, just in everything from the sort of trust and resilience that you have to have when you're physically working together in a space, in some ways working in a kitchen and operating like the, the production of food with people, balancing creativity and sort of operational rigor and teamwork and personalities. Um, a lot of that I think has relevance in the more abstract sort of white collar world that I ended up in. And so, you know, flash forward five years after that first job, uh, I left that behind professionally, but I ended up at a tech startup that was focused on the food business. And I was sort of the only person there who'd actually worked in the food industry and really ended up gravitating less to the food part and more to the company building part. How do we hire the right people? How do we set them up for success? How do we really run a company where you build that resilience, that grit, um, and, uh, that like clarity of purpose and training. And so, um, yeah, I, I it was sort of a circuitous path, but, um, it, I think of it as really foundational for my career. 
Yeah, I definitely appreciate you sharing that story and just all the skills and experiences that you've learned over the years as well that have led up to, to this point and years to come as well, whether you are in a kind of physical environment, a hybrid situation, in the kitchen, in a, you know, in a workspace as well. I think one of the reasons why folks uh, really stay at a company or kind of gravitate towards uh, industries too is around that company culture. Uh, I would love to know kind of what makes up the core of Artsy's kind of bottoms up approach company culture and what are some of the ways as CPO you really think about keeping a pulse on what's happening in both a qualitative and quantitative way uh, measuring this. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, Artsy is the leading global art marketplace for discovering, buying, and selling fine art. And our mission is to expand the art market to support more art and artists in the world. Um, the traditional art industry has long been constrained by sort of legacy art business practices, a lot of um, opacity and high friction. And we're really trying to transform that art industry to make it easier to buy art no matter who you are and create a more democratic industry that has more transparency, more inclusivity, is safer. Um, and so I think our culture has always needed to reflect those same principles. This is my first job in the art world. And honestly, when I interviewed for the role, I was like, oh, do I want to be in this sort of like, frankly, sort of snobby sounding world? Is this really, I've always loved <laughs> art. I grew up in going to museums. I took art history in college, but it just didn't feel like it was my world. And what I found already when I, I mean, I joined the company almost, oh, almost a decade ago, like seven years ago, um, is that that wasn't the culture at all. And actually quite intentionally before I joined and since I've been here, we've done everything we can to set up values that are directly tied to the way we're trying to change that industry. So um, I think our the first thing that I tell people about Artsy is our, our values are really meant to lead the way for the change we're trying to, um, to push through in the industry we're in. So one of our values, for example, is lead with openness. Uh, we expect our team and our leaders to cultivate trust and respect on the team so that our team can feel confident in being able to be direct and open with each other, to have bold ideas, to share feedback, to share information, to work across disciplines, whether you're coming from the art world or you're an engineer. Um, and I think that has really helped create a kind of mission purpose-driven environment where people understand like why that culture is there, why it's so important to meeting our, our goals as an organization. Um, another value of ours is transform together, which I think is very fitting. We're trying to transform a very old industry and we need to hire and uh, retain people who are comfortable with change, who see it as an opportunity, who like to think outside of the status quo and rethink things from scratch. Um, and tinker and test and adapt. And that that's that's hard when you're hiring from an industry that you're trying to change. Often the people that you have the right experience don't have that mindset, um, but we've been able to find, I think, a really incredible group of people who join with that sort of uh, mindset from the beginning. And as an executive team, as a group of leaders, I think our job is to really create clarity about what we stand for, what kinds of behaviors we want to incentivize, and then set up the right constraints, the right processes and goals so that people closest to the problem can really plug in and do their best work. Yeah, leading with the North Star of values, kind of the why behind why we want to make a change in, in the industry, how are we supporting the people that are uh, making that change as well on the ground and really having those conversations. Uh, I know kind of in terms of values and company culture, the mentors you have, uh, the organization you work for, they all contribute to uh, this thing of employee happiness and just like, you know, regular happiness, I would say you can't be happy all of the time, but how do you kind of define employee happiness at Artsy and what are the strongest elements and benefits that really support uh, employee happiness uh, from your perspective? Yeah, so we think the biggest impact we can have in people's lives as their employer is the ability to give people meaningful and purposeful work and an environment of trust, respect, and honesty. Um, that comes from helping match people's unique skills and career goals to the business opportunities and challenges that we have. So when people have a job that they feel challenged by, that they feel uniquely qualified for, that stretches them in a direction they actually want to be stretched, that's aligned with where they're, they want to be going, um, and that has a big impact on the business as it is today, you see all the core people metrics go up. Engagement, performance, retention, innovation. Um, and so we look at those metrics in aggregate, not because we think they measure just the thing itself, but because they're a signal to us about whether we're doing a good job at that core work of matching people and opportunity. We can't make people happy that are not in a role that is really 
the right role for them. And so our goal, my business partners, as well as our managers and our leaders are really to help align people's individual strengths and goals and skills with the actual business ones so that we're sort of moving in the same direction and um, that sort of meaningful, purposeful work can come through. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a huge difference that you can make there in terms of helping folks kind of understand that motivation, really giving people the opportunity to be challenged, learn new skills and continue to level up in their career. And it's directly related to their livelihood as well. When you have a mission, vision and purpose and leadership team that's really carrying that out, you attract a lot of people that are applying to roles that want to be part of the team. Uh, I would love to know what was kind of the biggest learning and growing the team from, I think, around 100 to 300 globally during the, the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, so many learnings. I think like a lot of companies, we sort of relearned also a lot of things that we thought we knew. And we'd always been a more distributed company than certainly than a lot of art industry players because we had a more distributed engineering team and had had to, we built our London office and had started to build our Berlin office. So we had some experience with more distributed practices, but by and large before the pandemic, New York was HQ. And um, suddenly having everyone on the same footing of not being able to be in an office, reset a lot of our culture, our communication, the way we work together in sometimes painful ways. Um, but I think two really big learnings stood out that made a big difference for us. One is we needed really masterful communicators in leadership positions. I think communication has always been a really critical component of being a good leader, but there was more forgiveness if you weren't as perfect in all aspects of it. Um, now we really need leaders at every level, even a line manager to like an executive. We need people who can communicate a lot, who just have that itch to like communicate, over communicate, say it in all the ways over and over in writing as well as in real life, in one-on-ones as well as in groups about tactical operational things and also like strategy and vision. Um, that's how you keep everyone moving in the same direction, working on the right things, not bottlenecked, feeling empowered and like they can make decisions on their own. And I think before we didn't realize how transformative it is to have people in management and leadership positions who are really great at communication. Um, so that's been a learning and, you know, we've hired for that, we've trained for that, we've given feedback around that. That's really become a really important component of great leadership at Artsy. The other thing I think that's been transformative for us is that we realized how intentional we needed to be about helping people connect as human beings, which is something that I think we took for granted and thought of as a kind of organic process. And I think, you know, before we were in a hybrid distributed world was, we were mostly co-located, mostly in the office most days. And we had a really strong, vibrant community of people who had their own personal relationships. And with that came trust and respect and the kind of the sense of camaraderie and humanity together that actually is really fundamental to working really well together. And that doesn't mean being best friends. It doesn't even really mean hanging out outside of work, but it does mean like having relationships with your coworkers as full people that are more than just a 2D sort of talking head or an email alias. And so we really had to find like to find ways to cultivate something that wasn't happening as organically. And we really built a sort of community strategy that allowed people to uh, to do that regardless of where they were. And we had to put real money behind it. I think it's not, you know, no one wants to come to another Zoom happy hour. People are Zoomed out and we had to put more money into travel. We had to create more events. We had to find creative ways for people to connect even when they were really far away and between those events. And that's been, that's been a learning process, but one that I think we've seen be super, super impactful to engagement, happiness, but I think even more like performance and ability for new hires to ramp up quickly and all of these sort of softer skills. Yeah, creating those meaningful moments of connection uh, is really important, creating the space, the programming, just really thinking about meeting folks where they are. Um, and also with that foundation that, you know, you're not going to be penalized for going to an event because you're worried about your work or if your manager is going to say, why are you going to these things as well? And this kind of leads into my next question. And I do want to talk a little bit more about the connection piece in a second too of kind of tell me about how you're rethinking of what it means to really be quote unquote productive. I certainly have rethought about what that means to me as well. Um, and what kind of it means to be present when working with remote and global teams. I know you said you've already kind of had that experience um, being distributed in the industry, but would love to hear more. 
Yeah. So, I mean, productivity, I think for us means getting the right outcomes, right? Both in your role and towards company goals in general. And that has tons of variation by function and position. I've seen a lot of companies want to pretend that's not the case and have sort of a one size fits all model. And I understand that instinct because you want to treat people in the same way and have as consistent of expectations possible across the team. But I think the reality is every role has different expectations, different needs, the job description looks different. So we've acknowledged for a long time that uh, different types of work require different types of skills in different contexts. And so we've tried to be as explicit as possible down to the role level about what are the expect expectations for productivity in this role? What does success actually look like? What does it look like to be really good at this role? And for certain roles like sales, it can be relatively straightforward, although we've had to be intentional about it's not just hitting your numbers, it's how you help the rest of your team hit their numbers. And sometimes you can do things structurally to help that um, be even more clear. Uh, for other roles, it's less clear cut. And so you have to spend time really understanding the, the point of the work and the function itself to be able to define what success looks like. And from that, you know, what kinds of work hours and availability and locational needs are inherent in that success? Vast majority of jobs, I think, have the ability to be effective with at least some work from home time, uh, which we know is best for heads down focused work. But many roles also do benefit from alignment with other colleagues, sometimes just in having the same work hours or time zone alignment, sometimes with like physical space alignment. How much of that you need really does depend on role, but also on um, how competent you are in that role. And if you have a track record of being able to be extremely well connected to your colleagues in that role, despite a, a you know a remote setup. Um, so we, I understand the temptation to have a more like one size fits all policy as an organization, but I think that's really throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And then I, I think most companies can do a better job of being more intentional and trusting their leaders and understanding the roles and creating more of that flexibility. Yeah, flexibility is another point that folks are looking for both in their lives and related to their job too. I think setting people up for success, defining that what that looks like with a kind of manager and individual contributor conversation through job design also relates to what you were talking about earlier in terms of over communication, really being intentional about communicating, you know, what are the norms and non-negotiables for my team, for the company. Uh, you mentioned Zoom fatigue earlier, which I know uh, continues to be a topic of conversation because, uh, you know, if you're in a hybrid or virtual environment, you are on Zoom or on camera uh, or off camera a lot of times in back-to-back -back calls potentially. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how you adjust for Zoom fatigue when you're thinking about creating those meaningful moments of connection and how you retain that personal element and really build in those moments um, at our team? Yeah, we've thought a lot about this. I think the first six months after the pandemic started, like many companies, we had all the Zoom happy hours and it was just very clear that the quality of those connections and even the attendance was falling far short of what we were aiming for from a, a team connection perspective. I think one thing we realized certainly as an HR team is that we couldn't do the heavy lifting when it came to creating community. We really had to help set up the structures and levers for leaders and teams on the ground to build that for themselves. Uh, but dumb example, we have like a weekly happy hour in the New York office, actually in each of our physical offices. And if it's just coming from my team, the like HR team is, as I think beloved as my team is, it's like, oh, it's another sort of company sponsored place to get a drink. When your manager says, hey guys, we had a really tough week. Let's all meet this Wednesday after work. I'd love to cheers to this success we had. And I'd love to introduce you to this new person, make sure they get some FaceTime with the team. Totally different reception. It feels like it's relevant to you. It feels directly connected to your job, to the people you're already sort of building community with. And so we sort of leaned into that and thought, okay, what would it be like if we created a culture where our leaders and every team member felt like they could organize an outing or a, you know, a Zoom trivia call or, um, you know, get together to celebrate a big win. And so we started sort of encouraging our, we have a group called our core leaders, which is sort of the, the director plus ish group in the company. And we started encouraging them to actually develop their own events, their own practices and kind of cultural norms. And um, we put real budget behind that and allowed them to 
um, know what they were actually working with from a resource perspective. Um, and that really went a long way. I think when we started thinking about it, like how do we create some of the micro cultures internally that themselves are really active and connected. And you see this when you look at Slack, there's these sort of sub communities that are very, very active. And then your general channel is sort of empty. Um, I think the same principle applies to connection. It starts small, it starts local. And so we really wanted to empower that rather than try to have some top-down approach. The other thing I think that's just worth noting is I we found that a lot of that sort of spontaneous like catching up in the hallway thing very challenging to actually let happen organically there's just something there's too much of a barrier in just slacking someone randomly to like chat and sync up about nothing and so that is actually a place where for our core leadership team for example we've added a couple of times during the week called like unstick time and that's just meant to be held space so that anything that you're just like, I just want to grab you for this quick thing. It's on both of your calendars. You don't use it if you don't need it. If you do need it, you know that that's like intentional space created for those kind of quick connections, quick unblocks. Um, because we found that that's something that did need sort of more top-down coordination to, to be effective. Love the idea of unstick time. I feel like I'm going to borrow that idea as well. Um, and really carving space out on your calendars that really gets kind of built up over time as well. If you don't really think about that too, giving people the opportunity to raise their hand and kind of use those resources, create events, and really think about kind of ways of connecting with folks too. When you are starting new programs or you're thinking about work in this different way and making changes, uh, you always have kind of feedback from the team as well. And I wanna ask what role does that feedback, the employee voice and uh, really contribute to the company culture? What have you found are the best ways or cadences for sourcing and, and receiving feedback on the many things you're doing at Artsy? Yeah, we've experimented a ton with different ways to get team feedback. When I first started, we were doing these really long surveys twice a year that took forever to process. And there was a pretty big lag between them, but they were really intensive and we got a lot of detail about tons of angles. Um, they didn't feel as actionable. They felt really heavy. We moved to like a pulse survey where every month we would have just a couple of questions. Then we felt like we didn't really have enough time between pulses to really make progress. Um, right now we're at a cadence that's worked pretty well for the last two years where we have a quarterly survey. It's a short list of questions that stays constant over time. We make a few meaningful commitments coming out of them and actually hold not just our like selves as a people team, but leaders accountable to them. They are company level priorities, not HR priorities. And it is the one place in the organization where people can give fully anonymous feedback. That's really one of our values is lead with openness, like I mentioned. And so most feedback, we do ask that people step up and own it. It's just a lot easier to address but we think it's really important for us to also have at least one place where people can speak totally candidly without having their name attached. And so that is our place for that. And it's been a very useful way to track certain metrics over time. For example, camaraderie was one that we very much looked at uh, this year. And when we experimented with different ways of team building and connection, we would get feedback on it. We would see people's approval around that go up and down based on what we were doing. And that was that was invaluable for us to be able to get that data at scale. Absolutely. Offering different opportunities to give and receive that feedback. Everybody is different and kind of what they are comfortable with as well. Again, creating that intentional space. Uh, I know I asked a lot of specific questions about your journey and what you're doing at Artsy. Are there any kind of common mistakes you're seeing companies out in the world making in their people experience strategy as they continue to scale to? For me, I think the most important sort of factor in company culture success is related to, I think, the biggest mistake, which is be really clear about what your values are and make sure that they really resonate and match your business goals and the culture that you're going to create with those values that actually reach those business goals. So I think a lot of companies have values that don't really suggest real trade-offs that are not actually guiding behaviors or help you hire kind of the right skill sets and the right um, the right culture ads for the team. We, I think, took a hard look a few years ago at our own values and thought about what are the types of behaviors that are really going to help us win and, and fulfill our mission and our vision. 
Um, we have a value, for example, that's impact over perfection. We need people who are focused on outcomes over process, who sweat the results over all the little details, who don't get hung up on research and the status quo, because we have a, a big industry to change and we need to move fast and, and kind of think differently about things that have been thought about one way before. Um, if we were a you know medical, make like a, a company that made medical equipment, that would not be the right value for us. We would you know, we would need people who really sweat perfection. There was a lot of compliance, attention to detail. And so I think when you're really honest about what your business challenges are and what the right culture is going to be to tackle those, you land at values that are really authentic to the challenges that you're solving. And then I think if you can really use them as a, a, a gauge for what kinds of people are successful here, how do you coach and train people towards those kinds of behaviors? How do you promote and even give you know recognition to those types of behaviors? You're really focused on values that really ladder into the big picture uh, rather than this sort of side list of fluffy phrases that people don't actually feel are relevant to their work. Absolutely. And they show up not only virtually and like in the in-person kitchen uh, kind of wall, but also it's manifested in decisions and what behavior is celebrated and what behavior is not. Um, Aliza, is there anything that I didn't specifically ask that you want to share with folks who are listening or, you know, underscoring any key takeaways you hope people really bring with them? I think I'll just end by saying, if you can land this values question, and I know a lot of founders and business leaders think it's just kind of a fluffy exercise, but my feeling is if you can really use that process and that set of phrases to align you on the kinds of behaviors and the kinds of success you want to see at your organization, then you can hire people and really trust them. And I think that's what makes a great culture is people really feeling a sense of ownership and trust in their work. Um, and from an HR perspective, all the way to a more, you know, business leadership perspective, when you have a team that you can trust, everything is easier. You can really let people do their best work and know that they have the right frameworks for doing it the way that will really unlock business goals. So get those values right and then be able to hire and trust your team. Yes, keep your values and really think about how they kind of show up and also uh, really build and cultivate trust, just like any other relationship too. Uh, thank you so much for being on Reimagining Company Culture this afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, and as a reminder for folks who are listening and all voices, we really believe in employees and employers being seen, heard, and understood. I know it's a requirement for the business to really succeed overall. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. 